In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of two local events were held in South Dakota, in Lemon and Fort Pier. Well, right now, is our seven, eight years ago, ten years ago, I used to think cows are really a detriment to our farm, to compaction, took all our residue. And now I, I wish we had more cows. Another thing is what happened, the best thing that happened to us was $6 corn. Because when everybody goes after $6 corn, it leaves all them minor crops alone. And that did us more good than anything because we raised 10 cash crops and 10 cash crops and that's nothing but a plus. And not only by finding different markets and doing a lot more work finding them, the, what it's done to our soil. Uh, it's just unreal, unreal what, how, when we diversified so much what it did to us. And uh, there's all different things like the flax and the mycorrhizae and the, the more you get into the rotation, the more you like it. The best one of what you have is behind flax, field peas and lentils. But another thing that uh, is, uh, is our cover crops. So we plant cover crops on 10% of our acres. It's usually on winter wheat. We flirted with planting them on corn stalks, on irrigated corn stalks. We, are, we have six pivots. And uh, with some, uh, some limited success, Dwayne's working with the clay seed ball. We hope that that uh, happens. Our pivots were corn beans, and now we're in a three to four year rotation. And uh, one of our crops that helps on that rotation is we plant teff grass for cattle. We've taken it for grain. If you guys have, have cattle and haven't, experienced teff grass, I encourage you to. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of uh, the cover crop on our grazing. We're going into full season cover crop. We're bringing our stuff home, and, uh, and that works. We like that full season cover crop. Then we also have a lot of short season cover crop we graze. But our cows were still going out. I mean, it, it, when that, <clears throat> we'll, we'll feed them a light feeding, and then they'll still go out and graze the cover crop. Or we, Paddock, should, no. Should we be? Yes. But we're not. But so our cows will basically winter on, on two sections and, and half of that will be planned to cover. But so I'm a big believer in cover, big believer in soil biology. And uh, I think it's been a really good meeting. One other thing I'd like to say, I think we really need to thank uh, Jason and Ruth because there's a lot of work being done put on this meeting. And so I really think we've got to give them a round of applause. Jerry, you guys want to arm wrestle, or who wants to volunteer? I'm Jerry Webb. Uh, I farm south of Harold, and we farm south of Highmore over in Hyde County also. Uh, we've been out there for a while. Our, we're a fifth generation. I'm a fifth generation farmer. Hopefully, we'll have a sixth generation. Uh, it was not as good as it has been the last few years and of course right now of course we're heading into more what I call normal farming times. Uh, my sons don't really know what it's like because they came back five six years ago and I said this has kind of been the golden years for us. But I remember back when I got out of high school and it was in the 70s and uh, there was a time when I was convinced that we could never grow corn in central South Dakota. Of course since the advent of uh, of no-till, it's turned into a fantastic situation growing corn and, and with the technology that's came about. And like I said, I have a great appreciation for Dr. Beck for what he's did for all of us. And uh, just the whole cover crop thing that we I've jumped on board with that. Uh, I think we started, I started dabbling with things like peas and things 10, 12 years ago or maybe even a little longer, and actually grown some cover crop for seed, lentils, vetch, and uh, radishes. And uh, I've seen a lot of agronomic benefit from putting the cover crops in. And I guess if the grain markets get much lower, I'm, and I even talked about it last year, maybe going to uh, full season cover crops. Uh, just, you know, you might as well work on your bank account one way rather than 
growing stuff just for practice. But uh, I've, I've jumped into some of the other programs uh, with the cover crops like the uh, uh, CSP and Equip because I really like the pollinator program. I think those are good things for helping out the, the bees and things like that because a lot of our ground has been taken out of native species. And uh, I know back in the 70s when we were primarily a ranch, I uh, kind of got tired of cows. I remember feeding cows out of, with a feed wagon for, what, 26 months straight? And you just think about how profitable was that. But so uh, I was kind of happy to get out of the cattle for a while. But now I'm, because of the cover crops, I'm starting to realize that we need to have them as part of our program for our soil biology. And uh, I guess I kind of have cows. I, we're raising, putting together a herd of low lines that started out as a hobby, and I kind of like them. They're not quite as big. They don't kick quite as hard. And, <laughs> and when you got one barrel in at you, it's not quite as intimidating as those 1,600-pound cows used to be. But uh, anyway, uh, We've had a lot of support from the NRCS, and uh, Jason, he's did some work out at our place with the Solvita uh, testing and, and the cover crop stuff we've been working on, and I don't know, maybe Jason, you want to show us some of these pictures? All I want to just talk about the slide here is um, how you planted this year with the rose with this yeah. some of the species. Yeah, we, uh, this was a picture of in June of our, uh, or July 15th of our equip acres or uh, equip pollinator acres and we had about seven or eight different species in there uh, you can see them listed all up there uh, it takes me a while just to figure out which one is which but uh, of course I'm a big radish fan uh, but it was kind of fun to watch them grow and uh, to see all the bee activity out in the field. Uh, I know, uh, I think I got stung more times this year than I ever had, but it usually wasn't the good bees, the honey bees, but I learned to not like bumblebees. Anyway, uh, they must have got quite a little honey because my, uh, the guy that puts the, co the hives out, he left me a substantial amount of honey, so. But anyway, we uh, got good growth out there, and uh, like I said, I think uh, it's, it's something that we, we need to think more about, probably. Uh, we, we can't, you know, when we go to monocropping systems, I, we're definitely probably harming the environment by not letting Mother Nature do all of the things that she does for us. But maybe Jason can tell you about some of this. I don't, know, I don't know how much I can tell you for sure. It's just that the local office, Dylan Law, the district conservationist, and his staff went out to Jerry Webb's place throughout the summer, and they did one of the soil health tests, the Savita test here, on uh, the, the cover crop portion of it, the one in the blue. And Jerry actually split this field where he had spring wheat on the other half, and that's where this orange line bar is. But the Sylvita scores here in May were both at 86. July, very close to very similar, uh, low 40s. And then in August, we saw the cover crop being just a little bit lower compared to the August one. Um, don't understand for sure 100% what's going on there, but I know there was a rain that occurred about 10 days before that. Visiting, visiting with Lance a little bit earlier this morning, asking him about that, and some of that could have been the cover crop use of water, and those active, those root systems may have absorbed some of that respiration and so forth. But then in October, when we looked at those uh, two sites, the cover crop was starting to basically go backwards or starting to be composed. We would have had more respiration there compared to the wheat stubble here. And then the black bar would have been just a, a nearby uh, pasture um, that was grazed, uh, not hard, uh, but it was it was left right, uh, and that was 162. But I believe the local office is going to continue to monitor this site for the next couple of years. So with that, Jerry, I guess Steve. 
Okay, uh, <clears throat> just tell everybody what I did. Jason called and asked if I could uh, share, I guess, some of my experience with cover crops. I've been uh, planting them probably four years now. Um, you know, we've heard today all the great things they do for the soil bi biological activity, but uh, I also have cattle, and I'm sure many people in this room the same way, and I think there's uh, a great opportunity for cattle producers. Uh, Anyway, here's, here's what I planted, uh, started right after, right after uh, weed harvest, basically the 1st of August, planted a mixture of 10 pounds of oats, 5P and turnips, radishes and rapeseed, and uh, I've been tinkering with the, the balance of what to plant for a while, and finally I did what uh, I should have did long ago, I called Brian Jorgensen and said, if you had to plant one thing, what would you do? So <laughs> this is what he recommended, and uh, I guess I was really happy with it. Here's a picture August 20th, you know, this stuff is uh, emerging, it's been in about pushing three weeks. There's a, the same time frame, you can, you can row it good. And keep in mind this year, you know, it's most people in South Dakota know we had a substantial amount of rain, so everything was perfect. If we could get this to happen every year, I'd, bore, I'd buy more cows is what would happen because uh, it's tremendous feed. Here it is, September 4th, it's been in the ground just over a, over a month. And then uh, here it is, uh, September 25th, and I have my uh, ranger parked out there just for, for size, so you know uh, know what you're dealing with. But the oats in there actually <coughs> actually got waist high and headed out and put seed on and planted August one. I never would have dreamt that. But uh, my cows were standing at the fence saying, "When are you going to open the gate daily?" Once once we got to this stage, but. Uh, Fantastic feed. Um, as we all know, the key to farm ranch profitability is efficiency. So what I did is I just <coughs> ran some quick numbers, just some farmer math here. The seed cost was about 10 bucks per acre. Planting cost, you know, you, you can punch in whatever you want. I just uh, threw in 15 bucks an acre. You can't hire it done for that, but if you're doing it yourself. So it cost me 25 bucks an acre. Uh, I had one quarter that I grazed specifically for amount of time, so I kept track of that. Grazed 160 acres for 45 days with 200 animal units in there. That's uh, basically the equivalent of 300 animal units a month. So uh, for 4,000 bucks, it, uh, it converts down to the monthly cost was $13.33 per animal unit a month. So that was uh, pretty, really cheap grazing and fantastic feed. So I just did a comparative cost if I was feeding hay for that month, and this is without supplements or anything else um, in the hay. <clears throat> 80 bucks a ton is uh, just a ballpark figure for 30 days, so 45 or 40 bucks a month. So this year, again, we got to keep in mind the amount of rainfall we had, but uh, for those 200, 200 head, it saved me about 5,300 bucks a month. And uh, I try to graze cattle out. Mine are still out grazing right now. They're getting some protein tubs, but that's all. They're grazing cover crops, corn stalks, milo stalks, and, and uh, just try and graze them as long as I can. I'd like to stretch that out to mid-March mid at some point. Um, the, f the first month, <coughs> I used to always wean my calves November 1. We just always did that. But uh, we always used to start calving March 1. Well, now I've slid that back. I'm calving April 1, and I thought, you know what? This cover crop looks so good. I'm going to leave the calves on the cows for an extra month. Both of them just really shined on that stuff. I mean, they put a lot of weight on those calves. I couldn't have weaned those calves off and fed them enough to make them look that good. Same with the cows. I think, I think you'd have to have at least 10 pounds of corn or more in that 
hay ration to have your cows be in as good a condition as they came off that cover crop. That's just a picture. Uh, January 10th, they're still out grazing, digging around in the snow, doing pretty well. The next couple are just, I wanted cow pictures, but I didn't have any, so this is, um, I had a muzzleloader deer tag this year, so I'm sending the deer blind. I can only shoot about a, shoot about 100, uh, 100 yards, and this is, actually took this through my spotting scope. But uh, This is a field that hasn't been grazed yet. My cows are going to go on their last before they go into my calving pasture, but you can see that those deer would stick their head down uh, all the way into their ears, and then you can see their head uh, moving around down there, and pretty soon up they'd come. If you look closely, he's got a le green leaf sticking out of his mouth yet. So uh, that stuff is still green, still very good underneath, and the, the cows and deer and everything will dig around and, and get it. So with that, that's all I got. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. Stay up here, too. Uh, you guys just want to come up or just stand up? Okay, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. It's going to be kind of a pain here because we got two two mics going here. But uh, first question, you want to have a question? Governor's uh, pheasant um, forum and so forth. Could you comment on the row crop value of pheasants versus CRP grass versus cover crops? I the value of pheasant hunting and, and the impact of the row crops versus CRP grass oh. cover crops. On okay, the impacts economically on from row crops CRP versus cover crops. Well, I'll try to touch on that as much as I can. I, I should back up a little bit, and I didn't really introduce myself. But I operate, you know, a cow-calf operation, uh, a farming operation, and a hunting operation. And uh, actually, all these things work really well together for me is the mix of the three. Um, the, the, the winter wheat, the, uh, the cattle, or I mean, excuse me, the pheasants, they love to nest in the winter wheat. Um, you harvest that, and uh, they'll slide into the, into the corner milo, your row crop. But then I also have CRP. And the, the, the nice thing about that is the CRP, is you're, we're allowed to hay a portion of that every year. That, that's my cattle feed that I'll be feeding from uh, the time I pull them off this stuff. So diversity is the key, I think, in, in, in pheasants. And just the, the combination of the three can maximize. I will tell you this year on that slide where you saw my four-wheeler out there, um, Opening weekend, we went out and started, started uh, chasing around some food plots, and we couldn't figure out for sure where all the birds were. They were in that stuff. They absolutely loved it. So uh, it's a little daunting when you got a quarter section of that and you're going out trying to chase them, but we had to do it, and that's, we had good luck out there. But uh, the pheasants love it. The, the deer love it. I mean, the wildlife really likes the cover crops. So I don't know if that answered exactly what you wanted, but I just think diversity is the, the key to, to, uh, to the pheasanting opera operation. And, and also, it's just nice to have your... your uh, your separate operations overlap a little bit where the CRP can help your cattle, the, the farming, obviously, it, as you could see, the cattle, I'm getting a lot of good use for that with the cattle too. So, you guys have anything you want to add to that? Yep. You know, in our operation, we're taking a lot back to perennials and in some of our salinity areas, especially around the farm, we're going back to switchgrass, and, and uh, the cows love it. It's a good uh, loafing place for them, but we've, uh, we've helped our fe pheasant population by doing this, and, and another thing they like is our teff grass. We'll usually take one cut in the teff grass, and then we'll let the residue come back, so residue will get, you know, 18 inches tall, and we'll leave that either for grazing or to plant into. And you talk about a pheasant habitat. I mean, it's just unreal. Like a lot of times the same thing, what Steve said, when them guys were hunting pheasants, they'd go out and they'd, they'd wonder where the pheasants were and that's where they are. They're in that habitat. It's not real good for hunting, but it's good for the pheasants. Okay, next question. Back there, Doug. Uh, 
Uh, talking about managing and establishing the TEF grass. The TEF grass? Yeah. Oh. This could be a question for Dr. Beck, but, and you can ask him too. We started growing TEF grass first time in 2007. And it's uh, about the time you have it figured out, you don't have it figured out. Uh, we don't, if we have our choice, we don't like to have coated TEF uh, a lot of, because that's just if you have to plant an extra pound and a half because of the coating on the TEF. You plant as shallow as you can get it. Uh, we did one trick that we learned from our neighbors. We planted it, then we rolled it, and I didn't like to do that, but we did it. And, uh, but uh, if you get an established stand and then it's, it, it, it takes off and it's, it's good. So if, if everything goes right in about 50 days, you'll have your first cutting. And uh, there's a guy over by Brookings that got three cuttings in one year off it if you cut it right at boot. It's tremendous feed. It's easy. It's once you get it established, you've got it. I mean, because you'll get two cuttings for sure. We always like the residue for the second one. Usually runs about 15% protein, and your horses will really love it. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a good feed. But, and then you can take about all the broadleaf out. And I think through some of the stuff that had been used around here, you can take the grasses out. You can take the broadleafs out. So it's a pretty easy deal. But if uh, one thing, you don't want to plant it too early either. It doesn't like frost. So, you know, uh, like the last few days of May, the f first part of June. And we usually plant, oh, five to six pounds is all you need. And if you shop around, you can get seed for three bucks. But... Uh, shop around a little bit and get seed for three dollars and then it doesn't take a lot of urea or a lot of nitrogen I mean like 60 60 to 75 pounds of of nitrogen's plenty but it's a it's a good crop I mean we we like it and it's in our it's in our rotation because it's such a good rotational crop and like I say we could go back and get our second cut in just about every year last this last year we had you know last two years we've had some this high that we leave and this year we grazed it a lot of times we'll plant corn into it. Did you tie up your closing mills on it when you're still No, we, you know, and Dwayne does that and we don't because we tried it and it, I don't know, we just, when we try something we want, it, it, <clears throat> Jason asked if we tied our closing wheels up on our drill. And Dwayne does and he has tremendous success with ours. You know, you tie them up on a 40-foot drill and all of a sudden a couple fall down and all of a sudden it's pretty easy for a farmer to throw your hands up. But what we'll do is we'll plant shallow. If we're gonna, if we're gonna err, we're gonna be error on planted shallow because if stuff is on top of the ground or close to the top of the ground, it'll come up if you get a rain. And like 30, 40 hundreds, it'll be seeded. And, and you guys, when Dwayne comes up here, you can ask him more on cover crop because, or excuse me, on Taft because he's grown, you know, as much as anybody has too. Okay, hey, next question. The residue wheels. What are your thoughts on getting rid of the residue wheels? The cl residue managers? All oh, residue managers. What are your thoughts on getting rid of the residue managers? We'll start here. Okay. You know, the residue managers, you guys, uh, we use them. We've got uh, pneumatic, so we raise them up a little bit if we don't need them. But we'll always run residue managers. It's just that a lot of times we don't, they're, they're barely turning. But we'll usually always use residue managers, but we'll do what we have to with them. It's not the old days where you set them down. We don't like to move a lot of dirt, we, uh, soil. We don't like to, <laughs> I'm looking. Mark Foster's shaking his finger at me, but anyway, anyway, we don't like to uh, move a lot of soil, and so a lot of times we just have them spinning a little bit. And another thing is what Paul said, Paul Yasa said, is, and I really agree with him, is you leave that. Well, we use strippers now, but leave that stubble, leave that stubble long. If we had the old spreaders with the the, the rubber belts on them, that's what you want. I mean, we don't. Before we had our our uh, shell borings, we never chopped or stumbled all, we let it all come out whole. Uh, we use the floating martins, and uh, they're not really too aggressive. Mine are getting a little war, but we're going to get some new ones, so I don't know, maybe that'll be. But uh, I, I prefer the trash whippers. No, I, 
I agree with what these guys say. I, I mean, it, in our area, if we get the, the really heavy wheat residue and things go down, you know, there, there is a need and a time, but there's, there's years where we don't use them at all, so it just depends. Okay, next question. The question was, who planted corn three inches deep? Jerry has. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, after after listening to Paul like last I was around him a couple times last winter. After listening to Paul after I was up a couple times last winter, we are working a little deeper. Do we go three inches? No, but we you know, like that two and a quarter, we're we really make sure we're at two and a quarter. I thought that was really interesting about planting close to the row because you know, like on our sunflowers and stuff. I mean, I'm really interested to to, to try that. I, I think that's going to be a, I think that's going to be kind of fun to work with. And what kind of success was it three inches deep? You know, I, it came up a little slower. Um, I was kind of kind of worried about it at the time because with the trash and everything, that soil can be pretty cold. And uh, but it it turned out all right. And uh, I think I'll probably go a little deeper than I have been. I usually <laughs> shoot for, for two, but after today's meeting, I think I'm going to try some different things. So, Okay, next question. Uh, okay, who's running stripper heads? And do you like them? Or what don't you like about them? You know, uh, we've only had them for two years, and so far we like them, but we've never had a really mat down. But, you know, we, they're especially planting winter wheat. We try to, we're 10 inch spacings. We're 100% we, we're low disturbance. I mean, we're, we're going to be low disturbance, or we're not going to do it. So, what we'll do on our 10 inch spacing, we'll try to plant in between our winter wheat. And that really helps with the stripper. But, uh, you know, another thing with the stripper is we strip our flax, and then we also stripped our teff grass. So we do spring wheat, winter wheat. If you're going to take teff grass to seed, teff grass, and then we'll strip our flax. But so far, we like our, we like our uh, stripper heads. One thing that, and it, it's going to, some guys up there are running the strippers on spring and then not on winter. They're running their, their uh, drapers. And the reason they are, you go out there and our soils are so active, you go out there like uh, three weeks after harvest and you pick your, your you grab a handful of straw and, the roots are pruned off, and so and then some. And I think that sometimes it has a tendency to blow. We haven't experienced that yet, but it, you know, maybe we're just lucky. I, all I'd say is I, it's on my wish list to strip her head. I, I agree with that. Okay. Next question. Pam. Um, uh, um, we, we didn't. You really can't graze it till after the flowering season's over. And that brings up a whole. Okay, the question one from Pam was, do you graze the pollinator mix? And in his situation with under Equip, the guidelines are somewhat a little not 100% correct. I'm trying to be politically correct here, Jeff. Ah. <clears throat> can't graze it until after November 1st, I think, if I remember right. And that would have brought up another question for Jerry is, uh, is he concerned since he planted it May 9th and 10th, he saw all that, all that material, all the seeds out there. My concern is it could be a potential weed, you know, problem next year. So any thoughts on that, Jerry? Uh, I love trash because it seems like we never have enough water and the more trash I've got sticking up in the air, the more snow we can seem to collect and uh, we contemplated the possibility, my son's a real pessimist and he's telling us how many weed issues we're going to have and I said, well, I know we don't like to use any more chemical than we have to, but nowadays there's enough stuff out there. I've planted into some pretty ugly fields. and. We've been able to work it out. In fact, I had a field of cover crop. I grew some lentils, and you can't use a lot of chemical on them. Back, they were the old Indian heads, and 
it turned out it was a weed patch like this and you could hardly see the lentils and I had my neighbor come up out here, Arlen Mayer, he's here. I said, well, Arlen, what should I do with this? He said, well, you could hay it. And of course, I didn't have any cows at that time, so it wasn't a very good option. Plus, I kind of needed to make a little money. But we ended up burning them down, and uh, it wasn't much fun to combine, but I made quite a bit of money on those lentils for seeds. So, uh, yeah, weeds are an issue, but we've got a lot of tools in the toolbox to handle a lot of those problems. You need to think about it for the next year's crop, for sure. You know, getting back to the stripper head too, you guys, be stripper head or oats. And uh, I love oats because oats, you know, when they were $4, they were a lot of fun. And now even at $2, they're, they're, they never go out of our rotation because they're a rotation and they're a heavy, heavy residue crop. Our oats usually get up to chest high and that's just exactly what I want because, you know, after harvest, we, ha we harvest them with the stripper head, but then there's enough residue, it really slows the weeds down. There's some volunteer oats comes, but that doesn't really hurt you. Another thing, if you're going to go into winter wheat on oats, just think about it. It's a, instead of a brother on a brother like spring wheat and then winter wheat, it's their cousins. So oats and winter wheat are cousins and not brothers, so you get away from a lot of the diseases. Oats will always be in our rotation. Are they going to really be a big player? No, but then a lot of the crops we raise on our farm aren't big players. I mean, they, we've got a lot of minor crops. It just helps our rotation. Steve. You can sing. <laughs> no, give it back to Jason. <laughs> okay, next question. Okay, Bo. Do you have trouble having the oats dry down when you're going to cut with a stripper header? No, we don't. And and we've been doing it now for three years, and we've never, with the strippers, and we've never had an issue with it. And uh, they just always dry down. I mean, it just, uh, uh, you know, and they, we usually, if anything, we wait till they're, they're ready. We don't, we don't push them at all. When we used to straight cut them, uh, we'd go in and, and maybe, push harvest a little bit. Now we, we wait. The straw is still green, but not real green, but we've always had dry oats. I mean, and another thing that I like about that is too, you know, like going them straighter with the strippers because when we used to put them in a swath, we'd always end up with 35, 36 pound oats. And now that we're straightening them more stripper and them, we're getting up to 40. We had some 46 pound Rockfords two years ago. Our oats this year weighed 43. So, I mean, it just, uh, and I think that's just because you're letting them uh, go to the full maturity. The college has got a really good oats now too, a, you know, a, a Hayden, you guys. So if you're, we really liked Rockford, but the college has got a good oats called Hayden and the grain millers accepted it for milling. So, I mean, it's a nice oats. Rick has a question. Rick. Years of limited rainfall, are you feeling your cover crops hurt the following year's cash crop? Why is it always me? Okay, it's going down the line this time. You know, the, I, I was really worried this year. You know, everybody talked about excess rain, and we didn't have it. I soil sample, we do our own soil sample, and I got a pickup probe. And uh, uh, the fall of, of uh, uh, 2014, I couldn't hold a core in the, in the probe. It had fall out, it was that dry. Come spring, we had about six inches of moisture. Everything worked right, but you know we just had the timely rains, timely rains, timely rains. The stuff we had on cover crop, I was tremendously nervous because I said, "What if I use that little bit of rain we had what, on winter wheat stubble? What if I did? What if I did?" It didn't show up at all. And now that's the second time that's happened where we've been extreme, and we were extremely dry last fall, and uh, and it never really showed up on our fall harvest. Uh, so. Right now, I'm going to say no. Uh, I, the one thing I, I've got to say is I think that I'm getting away from, I, I do the way that, I, when you plant your cover crop, the way it used to be is you'd always think, well, you know, if, if this is work a little bit more, I'll be better. And now I go by the NRCS chart, and I, I really stick with that. And I don't 
plant any more than they have to. A lot of times you get done, you say only 36 pounds I'm planting, but it might only be 17 pounds oats and whatever and whatever, but a lot of times thick isn't always better on cover crop. Just get something growing and, and then you'll get more growth. But as far as the moisture deal, I'm not really too concerned. I mean, I, you know, I strike me dead if I might be wrong, but I'm really not too concerned. When I first started cover crops, I would have to say I was quite concerned. Uh, but after doing it as many years as I have, it's really not a big issue. I think even on the worst case scenario, I think you're still going to get more benefits from the cover crop than whatever moisture that you would think you might lose. I just don't think you really do. Kind of like these guys, I was skeptical at first. You know, when you first, when when you first start hearing about cover crops, they were talking about being able to use your excess moisture. And in this part of the state, everybody goes, "What excess moisture?" But uh, anyway, I, I haven't uh, seen any negative results from from planting it. You know, on a, on a there, obviously there's some years you plant it and it doesn't may not come up. 2012 comes to mind, but uh, you know, overall, the, the following following crop, I haven't seen any. Uh, anything to make me believe that it, it drew the moisture out enough to hurt it. So. Okay, we got time for another question. Back there. How long are you stretching rotations out? Four years, five years. Yeah, four in, four in my case, and I, I haven't been doing 100% of my wheat acres. Basically, I've been doing it um, where, where I could graze, ease of grazing, where I had water, fences, whatever, but uh, it's, it's something that every year I'm adding more and more to where I will be, I think, 100% of my, following my winter wheat crop pretty soon, but right now it's every four years on my farm. I'm every five years, but like I said, I I would love to hit it a lot harder than that. Uh, like I said, we have some poor prices this year. I would love to throw in some extra covered crops in place of my spring wheat uh, just for the soil. We're a little bit of everything. We've got some four years to seven years. There's, we've got 13 different rotations. So, uh, you know, and... It, it, and nothing's really written in stone, but uh, I really want to protect the residue. Like most guys that have been in a long time, our soils are active enough to where uh, residue is a big, a, a big issue. Like uh, one thing on that, when I'm planting cover crop, it really, I made a mistake one year by having too many brassicas and, and uh, legumes in my mix, and, and uh, it took me a long time to kind of make up on that quarter. So I, I really, I, I try to protect our residue, and that's why a lot of times I, I, we're really high residue crops. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, our soils are gonna, our soils are there. We're gonna feed them, but I, if I got a chance to grow some res, residue, that's what we're gonna do. Can I say something else? You guys, I'm not trying to, you know. I just want to. There's, there's a couple of things that you really have to watch in, in, on cover crops, and that's the chemicals used last year. And then, the, and then so this is just like a whole new deal, so you have to plan ahead on everything you do. One year we had a, one year we flew some stuff on down at the river and it worked. The next year we flew, that worked, so then we flew more. Well, the only thing is I used the chemical that took all the brassicas out, and that was self. I didn't realize it, never even thought to look at the label. And maybe I'm the only one, but I mean, if you can learn from my mistakes, so you guys, whatever you do, pay attention. So think ahead. So if you're going to plant a cover crop on winter wheat, NRCS, there's a SDSU, they've got a lot of articles, a lot of pages out about what chemicals that you can use and cannot use and get by with. So just, just be, it's easier doing it that way than doing it the way I did it. One last burning question for anyone? Probably. Uh, just more for comments. You know, with our cover crop, there was all this rye. That's why I have to start the season. But here lately, it seems like we get three fourths of a year of rain and two weeks of rain. We get a lot more water. We all want to be. I think that's the biggest thing. I think the change for here lately is that really, really.
So are you guys seeing that uh, better infiltration that following spring before before the rain, rainy season hit, hits for a couple weeks? Yeah, it, without a doubt, it, it's a better uh, rain. I, I agree 100%, Raleigh. I mean, I think that's a good comment, a great comment, because a lot of times it'll, you know, we were on a, well, a, a heavy oats double plant corn last year, and we picked up 30 hundredths of rain, and we immediately moved to a field that had cover. They ended up yielding the same, but I mean, at least we could plant in the cover. So it's, uh, no, that's a good point. I mean, very good point.